I will for, for the video. So the only problem with these three videos that I want to show is that I cannot make the connections between the different services. So that's a bit unfortunate. And in particular, for some of the question which were, um, would you be able to combine together SparkQL search together with more, um, you know, like language models and so on? I think that if I would have been able to do in parallel the the different demo, you would have seen that you can combine them, which is probably a real challenge today. So one of the challenges in AI today is to, to be able to combine knowledge bases, um, like, you know, um, ontologies and, 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 and stack of data with this stochastic model. And I think we, with, with SparkQL and, and this type of question answering using natural language, we probably have a, a lead to try to combine them. Okay. So, um, uh, I think we can we can start with the video from um, um, uh, biodiversity PMC. So I'm not going to. So this presentation is for uh, Thursday, I think. Huh? This is the presentation that we I, I'm going to to plan to to do on Thursday. I hope you uh, you will see that. But now we can we can look at the demo um, for for biodiversity PMC. So that was in the it's it's loaded in the session that is supposed to happen now. There are three links. So it's not this PowerPoint, but it's something else. Is that correct? So there are, there are three links in the in the session in the in the yeah in the session for for now. Actually, you started with this. It doesn't look like they've been uploaded, so this is where they should be. I'll go and check with you. So we'll just go and check that now. Tanya. Yeah. Uh, so the videos there should be videos available for us to play, but they're not. Yeah, so there, the there are three links in the not in the PowerPoint in the in the session in the session. Okay. Yeah. So they should be here. Um, they're not currently available, so we'll just find out what's going on, um, so that we can play them. Oh, another option if you want, I have the video on my laptop, and I can do like Theodore did. And yeah, cool. Um, that, that that's also a solution. All right, let's try that. Again, some comments to use the time or questions in the meantime. Walter. I would like to reply on the questions uh, mentioned earlier. Um, the, the first question was about uh, limitations on, on the amount of, of DOIs uh, you can get back. I think um, that's mainly a limitation on APIs and, and, and web services currently. It's not, it's not a DOI uh, limitation. Uh, technically, the, the, the handle infrastructure for, for DOIs has, has no limitations whatsoever for that. Um, but yeah, Different uh, organizations providing services uh, may, may have limitations because it's actually costly and, and difficult to uh, to really scale that uh, that very well. Uh, so it's it's not a DOI limitation, I think. Um, the other question uh, for, from Donut regarding metadata, um, it's a tough one, I think. Um, so we have we have some metadata uh, that we want to have in the in the in the pit records, uh, but we want also to create the uh, the pits uh, as early as possible in the in the life stage of of the specimen. So already at the, at the collection stage in uh, in the fields, you should be able to uh, to create your distal specimen so that you can add information to that during the whole lifetime of the the specimen and beyond. Um, and that means that there is very little uh, metadata available at that time. Uh, so uh, we cannot make these, this metadata uh, mandatory. Uh, so most of the metadata is not mandatory. Um, so I think the best way to solve that, uh, it, it's basically it's, it's a sociological problem. Um, but you can tackle that partly by uh, talking with uh, the CMS uh, developers, providers, and solve it at that level. So uh, make it mandatory uh, in, the, in the CMS, uh, provide services in, this, in, this, in, the, in the collection management systems to provide that, uh, that metadata. Okay, uh, but... I'm ready. I didn't mean at all limitation in DOIs. I know you can put as many as you want, but it's really the limitation of how many you can query to make it useful in practice to 
because they wanted to query all the research output of Belgium, and that was simply impossible, because all the, I put them in the chat, all the online API they tried, they all had limitations, where they said number too high, and they never could do the analysis they wanted to do. Yeah, it's indeed, limitation is on APIs normally, but I don't know what we can do with that. So we have to, to continue with the presentation of Patrick. Okay, thank you very much, Lubo. So I will uh, proceed with the video. So this is the URL with, you can you can already go there if you want. Um, so of course the services is powered with with API and and all what you need to to contact this with with uh, programs. But for the the um, end user platform, so you can basically search for um, any content. Um, so they are already a few examples here. Um, you could you could even try to search for content which are not um, traditionally uh, within PubMed Central. As I said, so th the system is also harvesting uh, um, pens of journal which are not uh, within PMC, but also other um, uh, publisher journals. So we are working with the European Journal of uh, Taxonomy to also. Um, Welcome their content. So, um, okay, let's let's try with some examples. So, my, my, my favorite one is the this type of of bugs. Um, uh -huh, that's a, now I have a network issue because my my Wi-Fi is disconnected. But it's going to come. Let me check. Yeah, okay, so it's connecting slowly. Um, so um, what you would have, as soon as I get the network, I will show you, you will have a, a search within Medline, within PubMed Central, and it's a, it's a larger content than the standard PubMed Central, because as, as I said, we have, we have publishers that are not into PMC. We also have um, another index, which is, um, so, which is the supplementary data. So it means that we, we index um, within PMC, you have these supplementary data files, you know, CSV, um, Excel files, um, images, TIFF, uh, JPEG, and all that stuff. And actually, what we did is that we indexed the content of this. And for images, we, we indexed the OCR. So we, we, we first um, OCRized the, the images in different directions to, to extract the text. And the four collection that we display here is Platzi. So we have all the... Um, treatments as provided by Platzi. So let's hope it's coming. Let me see. What the other thing I can do is what we normalized, how we normalize the data. Yeah, so it's coming. So Medline already, you get the results. So these are all the Medline records uh, with the content of the query, okay? And, and more are going to come. I think there is some latency. Uh, this is PubMed Central, uh, this is Platzi. So again, you have match into uh, tr treatments. And of course, it's all um, um, cross-reference with, with treatment. So, so if you go to uh, click here, you will land to the uh, treatment bank, OK? Um, you can also go to the publisher straight with Zenodo. And there are a few links here that we are going to, to explore later on. So this is just um, a sort of larger uh, PMC, in a sense, that put together everything about biodiversity, ecology, environmental sciences, and the biomedical content. Um, so if you would look at that one, for instance, um, that's full text, so PMC is full text, and you will be able to, um, to display the content of the paper with um, which are a lot of annotations in there. I think most of them, you, you may not want to have all this annotation and all this colorful stuff. So you may just hide them all, and just select the one that you are interested, which could be, for instance, the ENVO, Environmental Anthology. You know, so maybe you are interested in, uh, yeah, in that one is interesting. Maybe you know, vapor is a, a very specific type of, uh, um, um, let's say, environment. Okay, so this is what we have for the PMC. I think we can move to the um, supplementary data. Supplementary data is mostly impressive when dealing with images. So let me check if we have some 
uh, JPEG. So let's take only the JPEG here uh, and see whether we have something interesting with the images. So will it, uh, yes, it displays properly on the screen. So um, so it's a bit small, but but I hope you will believe me if I tell you that somewhere in there there is something like assassin bugs. Okay. Um, oh, it's here. You see. Um, so all the, the the text has been authorized. I can close that one. So if you're looking for um, phylogenetic trees or any information which could be in the image, that that could be relevant. Uh, okay, supplementary data. Permit central, uh, Platzi. I only show you that we can. I need to remove the filter. That we can. Um, okay, we can go back there. Um, one thing I can show you is the um, this biotic interaction explorer. So let me let me show you this. I think that that paper is maybe not so much, so rich about interactions between species. Yeah, it's relatively poor regarding interactions. Um, so let me open up another one, uh, the, the, the welcome page. So this is the Biotic Explorer. Um, so again, the examples here, you can, you can provide your own if you want. Um, but we can try with uh, this one, I think. It's a nice one. So let's search for interactions between uh, Oncomelania upensis and Schistosoma japonicum, okay? Of course, again, um, you can you have a completer. So if you if you if you want to change the the entity here, then you can have a more generic one, or you can go back to um, Upensis. Let me go. Yeah, it's here, and then it will refresh here. You can um, select a particular uh, subspecies or whatever you want, and then you can search for the uh, wool literature for this type of interactions between the, the, the two species. You could even uh, be more specific and say that you have a, a, a particular type of interactions between these two, you know. Uh, but here, let's, let's try to be a bit more generic because we want to find some matches. So um, this is being loaded. So again, we, we go through uh, Medline, um, uh, PubMed Central, um, Treatments, here we, you see we have no, zero match into uh, Platzi, but we have to wait for the answers from the other collections. Um, while it's processing, I can show you another um, service on, um, on uh, uh, biodiversity PMC. So um, I wanted to, to say that you can, you can ask real questions. So uh, of course, if you search for keywords, then you will find match in, into papers. But if you come up with a natural language question like that one, then the system will try to answer your question truly. So let's run it. Um, so the search for the question answering is limited to Medline and Platzi. So we don't try to search into PubMed Central or supplementary data simply because the language models, in particular for um, supplementary data, get confused. You know, there are no verbs, no grammar. It's only um, entities, and it's very difficult to, to make sense out of it for the, the language models that we use. So we use a simple BERT, and I mean, we combine the BERT and a Robota uh, a transformer here. OK, so the question was, what species can be vector of eggs of Dermatobia hominis? And the answer return is, is um, some mosquitoes. Uh, of course, um, uh, human boat fly, this is in Medline. And then we have the answer on, on Platzi. So the answer on Platzi is Fania Puzio, which is also actually a, um, a boat fly. So, so both collection here would provide quite good results. Okay, these are different species, but all these species can be the vector of eggs of uh, Dermatobia hominis, by the way. Here you have a score, which provides an estimate of the confidence of the answer. Okay, above 50% means relatively uh, confident. And, uh, and uh, that one, 97 is very high, you see. Uh, actually, um, if you would have time to read it and to zoom into this, then you will see that it's uh, it's 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 very valid. Um, okay, this is for the question answering. So you see, and actually, you can also from there you can go back to the uh, biotic interaction explorer. So it's called Biotic Explorer, 
and then again run it against Medline and, and the bull collection and get some hits. So here you will see that um, that, that is the first record uh, showing that this particular species interact with these other species carrying eggs. Another occurrence here at the at, at just below and a third one here. And if we go back to the original query, which was with uh, Japonicum, I think she's a stoma. I wanted to see if it replied. Uh, where is it? I have too many windows open. Uh, no, it wasn't that one. You see, that's a poem of the live demo. Um, I'm still processing, you see? There are many matches. But I think I'm done with the demo mostly. Um, oh, the, I should demo also the SparkQL endpoint. Um, but to do that um, live, uh, I, would, I would clearly recommend you to go to the, to the video or to, to the tutorials, because I can not, really not write a SparkQL query like this by heart, you know? Uh, I'm sure Guido can do that, or, 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 maybe, or maybe Theodore, but, but I will let them do that. So um, this is what you can do with this. So maybe if I get the sound, I can do the SparkQL video. I, I, do I still have time for the running a, a, a three minutes video? So, yes, a couple of minutes, yes, because yeah. we are so, late. So let me, so now I move to the video just for the SparkQL endpoint. Um, if I can try make, to make large. Yeah, it seems it's working. So this is the endpoint of uh, the, the um, 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 biodiversity PMC, which is actually, um, we call them internally uh, the SIB literature services, but um, I believe um, it, it really um, has the, the, the ambition to, to be uh, a biodiversity PMC. So we develop a specific ontologies. It's very similar to what has been done um, uh, in, with open biodive. So you, you can look at the ontology. So we use the, the usual uh, uh, premises and, you know, like scores and Fabio and, 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 and the like. Um, okay, you have all the different um, classes if you are interested. You can, it's, it's quite uh, documented for, because of course, SparkQL endpoint needs intensive uh, documentation, documentation, I think much more than SQL. Um, then we can show a few, um, uh, and, and of course, um, uh, yeah, I should have mentioned it. So we have all these annotations, you know, um, we annotated the, the literature with um, about 20 different ontologies, you know, uh, we use three, uh, four different taxonomies. So we have NCBI taxonomy, we have the catalog of life. We have the mammal um, diversity database. So we, we are able to work with different taxonomies depend, depending on your fields. Um, beyond taxonomies, we annotate chemical compounds, um, uh, traits, you know, ENVO. ENVO is typically uh, something that would provide some traits of, of, of phenotypes for species. So this is a query that is executed here. So, um, I think it, it counts uh, articles having the certain properties, the one that were proven in, in the previous uh, uh, queries. Um, so, it, so it's very similar again to uh, upon biodive from that point of view. Um, again, um, you can look for um, um, co-occurrences within the same sentence, within a section. Um, you can look for relationships, so species one, uh, interaction one and then species two. Okay, this is also the type of query you can you can run. Um, this is an example of the type of scheme that we annotate. So not only uh, the gene ontology, the the the, the um, um, proteins. You know, uniprot, nextprot, these are uh, protein uh, instances, but also cell line with cellosaurus, um, KB for ca chemical compounds. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm. Unfortunately, I cannot show taxonomy in this example here, but we are working with these different types of taxonomy. And of course, you have access to the uh, the keywords, which is the annotation, the, the, the description, and also the source uh, article. I think that's um, I think that's all for the um, SparkQL endpoint. And I'm, I'm very happy to to uh, to do your live demo anytime you want. So this question is maybe uh, if I go back here. So this question is like, 
this is typically a question um, that you could have in natural language, which is provide me all the uh, disease that can be caused by ticks. Okay, um, and actually the the results you could you could uh, get the results with um, having a natural language query, and you could have the results with a SparkQL query. You see that tick is investing in, in, in investing um, different. Um, uh, you see, this is granulotic uh, erylicia, and then it can cause also all sorts of uh, encephalitis. Okay, so, and you, if you do exactly the same query with um, uh, biodiversity PMC in natural language, you will see that we get different answers. The answers like Borreliosis would come up. So it's very complementary to use SparkQL and natural language search. I think I'm done. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? We entered the discussion. We have um, 20 minutes till the lunch. So please share your views, comments, or questions with us. Are there some online questions, by the way? Can we, can we? Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Um, very interesting talk. And again, I'm curious about the rights here. <laughs> Let's say, you know, you extract the information you wanted. What about the usage of that in, let's say, in a database afterwards? Can you customize, like I might say, maybe you can customize also the search and text mining. And then if you extract it, like, can you use that input to actually then to populate your own database with that? And what are the rights have you, like, do you need to cite the, t the Swiss tool or, you know? Well, normally PubMed Central. Patrick, you will respond on that, but it's open data. So in a sense, this is no different than, than doing this with um, the National Library of Medicine, you know? So, I think in principle, I'm, 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 I, I haven't checked the regulation in Australia, but there is, there is more and more this TDM, so text and data mining regulation spreading all around, which means that basically if you get legal access to the content, so either it's open access, like most of what we have in PMC, or Creative Commons, CC0, or whatever, or you paid to get access to it, then you're free to use anything you want. Of course, this is um, not taking into account uh, um, Sci hub and because normally you need legal access to it. Okay, but if you have legal access, you are pretty free to do whatever you want with TDM. And this is true in Switzerland. This is true all over Europe. I think that the, the the champion were the UK. It started already in '94, something like that. But but it's spreading really everywhere. So I would be very surprised if it would not be the same in Australia. Given that you cite the articles you use, of course. Yeah, but that's a matter of ethics, not a matter of matter of regulations. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I can see that you have used the knowledge graph and the sparkle is very pretty impressive. So I have a quiz, uh, query is like uh, not every other users like end users they know Sparkle. It's a bit complex, and then even people who knows SQL they are not able to write down the Sparkle query. So do you have some kind of user interface where users write down in the natural language, and in turn at the back end they write down the Sparkle query for the text that was written in the natural language? Do you have something like that? Yeah, actually, actually you have seen the user interface. The Sparkwell, it's on the top of that. It's a separate service for Sparkwell users. But there is also user interface when any any user, any biodiverse scientist could simple, uh, simply enter the species he's interested in or she and get the data through another service from the same database. But Sparkwell is much more powerful for complex questions. That's, that's the difference. Something like we write down in the chat GPT, like, okay, I want to find particular species, something like that in the natural language, something. Well, it, 
not so easy. Maybe maybe Patrick can explain how biodiversity PMC does that. But what you can find, there is a preset of um, a list of Sparkwell queries. For example, I want to find all type specimens which have been burned into into Rio 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 fire Rio de Janeiro museum fire from the order Diptera. If you change in the Sparkwell, you just run the Sparkwell. If you change Orthoptera, it gives you the result. So it's a kind of let's say <laughs> kind of a shortcut to to learning uh, Sparkwell. But you can simply post a very complex query just in natural language. You can do this in chat GPT probably, but not. Thank not. you. I have one more question. So as you have used the knowledge base and then you have lots of ontologies. So are you using the semantic reasoner to infer the new knowledge? Patrick? I, I take that one. Um, actually, the reasoners will be mostly useful to check the consistency. While because to to um, resonate, I mean, may again sounds a bit strange, but you don't need the reasoner to resonate. You only need to to run the SparkQL because the SparkQL is going to be unifying your your its unification base. So to to resonate, you don't need resoners. Resoners will be especially useful if you want to check the consistency of your uh, of your annotation. You know, um, I would say that um, I would say we we normally don't do that. Uh, in a sense, that would mainly make sense if you would create uh, an ontology and you want to make sure that your ontology has, has logical consistency. And for that, because we rely on uh, Obo Foundry or on, on, on others doing the ontology yeah, uh, all around or scores or whatever, then we fortunately don't need to check consistency. So that's a, just a way to push the burden uh, to someone else. Um, and. I, I hardly can see an application where we, we really need to, to, uh, to do this type of consistent check, check internally. So, yeah, be happy to, to take it offline. Yeah. 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 So, other questions? Uh, there are some comments, but I think, Pat, we discussed that already on the chat, what is on the chat about use of DOIs, limits in APIs. We did discuss it already. Other questions? No, just a remark for the people online. They couldn't see the videos well. They were a bit blurry. So they are asking Patrick if they could send him the links uh, somewhere or if we could post them online uh, in the chat, the links to the videos. Good point, actually. If we, maybe Theodore, you can go and. I guess at some point we will publish all these presentations alongside with the abstract. So they, they will be available. Yeah, but if the, if the people ask now to post the two links, uh, just do it on the chat, and that is, yeah. yeah. Of course, all those services we demonstrated today, they are available on the Biodiversity Knowledge Hub website, biodiversityknowledgehub.eu, as you hear it. And uh, from there, you can go to all those videos. Very soon, all services will have videos fact sheets and tutorials. So we are working on that. This is a work in progress. And uh, we are very happy to get any feedback from you about usability, about uh, user friendliness. And also we expect that a couple, couple more services will be put on the website before the end of bicycle. And we hope very much it will be expanded in the future with other partners, other infrastructures. It's really open, really open for collaboration. If we don't have more questions, maybe we will have more time for lunch then, right? Good. Thank you very much for attending this session. Thank you on behalf of all partners of Bicycle Project.